Hello and welcome to Another Plain Truths and this week we're going to be talking about cabin pressurisation. <laughs> Joining me, as always, is the legend that is Captain Al. Hi, Captain Al. Hello, Matt. How are you doing? Yes, I'm good, thank you. Yes, I'm very well. Okay, I'm very familiar with the phrase uh, cabin pressurisation and also sudden depressurisation. And I suppose my first question really is, why is the cabin pressurised in the first place? A, a lot of like the GA planes and stuff that we fly around here, for example, they're just, you just open a door and, it, and it's all fine. So what's the main purpose behind pressurisation? Uh, the main purpose behind pressurisation is that if we didn't have it, we would die. Oh, well, I mean, well, OK. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so sure. without being quite so flippant, <laughs> um, if I was to teleport you to the top of Everest, which is what, about 18,000 feet or something like right, that? yeah. How do you think your breathing would be affected? Well, I know, I know you're certainly at high altitudes and stuff, the air is much thinner up there, therefore it's much more difficult uh, for you to, to breathe. <laughs> okay, so the air is a lot thinner the higher we go. So uh, this is very, very simple. So if there are any you know, doctors, please don't write in. I, I don't want to go into great detail about <laughs> no, this, but no. those little molecules of oxygen are much more spread out. So when we take a breath in, we're not getting the same uh, amount of right. oxygen volume. Yeah. yeah, It's not that there is less oxygen at altitude. There is the same proportion of oxygen in the air as there is at sea level. Right. But it's a lot more spread out. Right. So it's the same air. It's just that it's uh, uh, a lot less dense. Okay. That's at 18,000 feet. If we were to put ourselves at 35,000 feet and try to breathe, we will become unconscious within about three or four seconds. So we need some way of making it possible to survive at the altitudes that the aeroplane is going to operate in. So we need to pump air into that cabin at a greater volume than it can escape so that we can condense the air, if you like, make it dense so that we can breathe. So that's pressurization. We pump a load of air into the cabin and slowly let it out to regulate what the cabin altitude would be. So it would be very nice if we could keep the aircraft at sea level all the way up to 35,000 feet. But we also need the aeroplane to be light enough to fly. And we can't pressurize something that's thin aluminium to that sort of level because obviously to pump that amount of air in, we need the fuselage to be strong and the amount of pressure that we would have to apply pumping it in would just burst the aircraft. So we can't do that. Right. So most airliners pressurise the aircraft at altitude, and it varies a bit. Some of the modern ones are a little bit lower, but between six and 8,000 feet. So when you're sat at 35,000 feet, that's the altitude that the aeroplane's at. But within the cabin, because we're pumping in loads of air, it's at 8,000 feet. So basically... We pump loads of air into the cabin and that exerts a pressure of about eight pounds per square inch trying to get out. So that is why when you see people trying to open doors on aeroplanes in flight, it simply won't work because the doors all open inwards. That's a design feature. <laughs> so the doors are effectively being pushed by the air pressure outwards oh, right, and because yeah. the door frame is smaller than the door they're not going to go out so there's no way anybody could open it in now eight pounds per square inch doesn't sound a lot but it is quite a significant amount there's no way you could open a door right so that's pressurization we need it to sustain our life at that sort of altitude okay uh, one of the benefits of uh, pressurization is that we're pumping this air in we can control the temperature of it so we can therefore condition the air so we can have it at a nice comfortable temperature because at 35,000 feet, typically the outside air temperature is around about minus 56. Right, oh, that's quite, no, that's quite chilly. chilly. Yeah, the frostbite territory right there, I think, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I think the, the coldest I've ever been outside anywhere was in Canada and I think that was something like minus 32 or something like that. <laughs> so it's still a good good deal warmer than minus 56 minus 57 so that's obviously the pressurization of the aircraft so the function of that if you like is to make it presumably a easy much easier for us to breathe well if um, we didn't have it as we climbed up as we go through about ten thousand feet most people will start to become a bit sort of light-headed light yeah start to get things like cyanosis which is you know it's basically a lack of oxygen in the blood so your extremities will start to turn blue your lips will go blue your fingers will go blue this is the onset of hypoxia, incidentally. As we continue to climb, depending on how used to altitude you are, so people who, say, live in 
the Himalayas. They will last a bit longer. Um, as we sort of progress up around about 14,000 feet, it's starting to become quite serious. Um, incidentally, hypoxia is a, a strange beast. Uh, one of the symptoms of hypoxia is euphoria. So you feel really good, so you don't actually feel unwell. Right. It's a bit of reverse programming there. So typically, people who are hypoxic don't realize it. And then eventually, you just become unconscious. And if you continue to climb, you will eventually die because there isn't uh, enough oxygen uh, saturation to sustain uh, life. So as jet aircraft, well, actually, when we had turboprops, they started to climb higher and higher because, as we've mentioned several times on previous episodes, aircraft, uh, the higher they go, the less fuel they burn, therefore, uh, greater distance, etc., etc. So that became more so with jet aircraft. So, yeah, it became a, a necessity. It's not a luxury, it's a necessity. And now, presumably, rapid depressurization is presumably where something like the, the systems involved in pressurizing the cabin have gone wrong or failed for whatever reason. Yeah, so if we talk about pressurization failures, we'll split that up into two. Okay. So there's a slow depressurization and a rapid depressurization. So let's have a look at the slow case first. So a couple of things. We control the rate of climb within the cabin because uh, obviously the aeroplane might be climbing at 5,000 feet per minute. We don't want to subject you to that because your ears cannot handle that amount of pressure change. Right. That's why you have popping ears and all the rest of it. So we will typically climb the cabin at a much lower rate, so maybe 500 feet per minute, which we can deal with. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we still pump the same amount of air in, but we let some of it out. Right, okay. And we control it. So if you ever have a look at the, the rear section of a passenger airliner, you'll see a flap, and when it's on the ground, it's open. It's the outflow valve, and it allows uh, to flow out of the pressurized section of the aircraft. So when it's open, any air that we push in effectively comes straight out. If we were in flight and we were to close the outflow valve, which it tends to be more or less closed are we in a sealed container no because we've got windows doors and much as we try to we can't create a perfect seal yeah vacuum when the airplane yeah. yeah well not not quite a vacuum but just you know at the end of the day anything that's got openings in it has the tendency to leak it leaks less when it's new yeah. You know, and if you've ever had a, you know, 35-year-old car, you know, the door seals aren't quite as good or the window seal's not quite as good. And that's the, the same on an aeroplane. So there is a natural amount of leakage. It tends to be less on a new aeroplane than an old aeroplane. Uh, and all within acceptable limits. So the aeroplane does leak, a bit like a boat. Cruise ships, yeah. you know, they're always pumping bits of water out. Yeah, it's not a, a, you know, perfect Perfectly thing. normal, yeah. So if for any reason we have a failure of one of the pressurization computers, whatever, the aeroplane will just slowly depressurize. And when I say slowly, maybe over a period of, you know, five minutes or so, depending on how leaky it is. So this isn't a, a critical event. Now, talked about computers, uh, just very briefly on the aeroplane I know, the Airbus, modern Airbuses have two pressurization com computers. So if one becomes faulty, the other one automatically takes over. And then there's a backup. So the backup is just using electric motors to control that outflow valve. So it's the manual backup. So you still have control of the pressurization. It's just operated by the pilot rather than a computer. Right. So there's the primary, the backup, and if you like, the, the manual mode. So there's three ways of controlling the pressurization on the airplane. So the only real way that you could have some sort of issue is if the actuators for the outflow valve were physically jammed. So it doesn't matter which of the three systems you use to try to move yeah. that, it, it, it's stuck. It, okay? yeah. Just a slow depressurization is not a big deal. You just make a, a normal descent and you could get down to, to levels where you'd be able to either regain control of the pressurization or just fly at a lower level that would allow you to operate the aircraft, not necessarily to destination, but maybe to make a precautionary diversion. So that that's not a big deal, if you like. Now, the kind of fast depressurization, often called an explosive decompression, is a bit more of an event. If we can take ourselves away from Hollywood, where, you know, someone <laughs> fires a gun and, right. you know, the next thing, there's massive chaos within the cabin and people are being sucked out. Yeah. As I've already said to you, the airplane naturally leaks a bit. So if yeah. someone fires a pistol and it happens to penetrate 
the skin of the aeroplane and leave, you know, a, a small hole, hole yeah. yeah, a bullet hole, that's not going to be any great deal because we can push more air into the cabin than that hole is going to let out. Now, a bit dramatic, but if someone, you know, explodes a bomb on the aeroplane, that's going to leave a bigger hole. Okay? That's going to be like the size of a door. And that's going to be a bit of an issue now because we've got a fairly large opening. Physically pump that much air in, essentially. Now, as I said, we're pumping air in, so we're putting pressure on. So exactly like when a tyre or a balloon pops, when the pressure exceeds the ability to contain it, it does tend to go bang, if you like, because that pressure has to equalise. So there will be a fair amount of commotion in the cabin because now you've got a pressure differential. So things that aren't secure within the cabin are going to want to go out through that hole. Um, And there was a case a few years ago where a terrorist did let a bomb off. He was sat at the window. The bomb was successfully detonated and a sort of like door-sized hole was created next to him and out he went. But he was the only one. So everyone else had their seatbelts on. So yes, there was a, a big hole and they were able to move people away from the hole and he was the only fatality in that. Right. So, yes, there have been occasions where large sections of aeroplane have come off in flight. There was a, an Aloha Airline 747 where a large part of the roof came off. Quite clearly, you're not going to be able to pressurize the aeroplane when something the size of a small family car has come off the aeroplane. But the, these are very few and far between events, these explosive depressurizations. Passenger doors on aeroplanes are bigger than the hole that they fit into, so they don't naturally come out. Windows, they don't tend to fall out on a regular basis. I can only think of two in the last 40 years, so I don't know how many million flights you'd have to take before that, you know. A very low percentage, certainly, yeah. Yeah, so explosive decompressions are very rare. Where we've talked about failures of the pressurization system, If you had, you know, lost control of the pressurization system, say the outflow valve was forced fully open or whatever, and you can't pressurize it, the the airplane's going to depressurize fairly quickly. So you would initiate then an emergency descent. So the first thing that would happen is the two pilots would go on to oxygen because without us, no one else is really in a good position. (laughs) So we'd go on to oxygen and then we would descend the airplane as quickly as we possibly can. The idea being is that On most aircraft, the passenger oxygen masks will deploy around about 14,000 feet in the cabin, okay? Right. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the aeroplane down below 14,000 feet so that we don't have the mask deploy. It's not a cost thing, but we know that when the masks drop out of the ceiling, people will panic. Panic, yeah, absolutely. Uh, And the panic will cause more injuries than the actual anything defense. else right yeah. okay yeah so so we, we try to get the airplane down below 14,000 feet if we can do that yet yeah, the airplane is now unpressurized but passengers are sat down so they're not undertaking huge physical activity so they're, they're going to be okay they're not going to suffer too much and then it depends on how high the the ground is around you if you can you continue to just descend down and, and decide what you're going to do but The key thing is that significant depressurization events are not common. And if you do find yourself in one where the masks come down, please do what it tells you to do in the safety information film or demonstration. Put your own on first before helping others, because if you're faffing around trying to put someone else's on, you become unconscious. You're no use to them. So if you're a parent, put yours on first. If little Bobby collapses, it's only lack of oxygen. You can put yours on, then put his on, and he'll be back with you super fast. In in seconds, yeah. Yeah. Um, So put yours on. It needs to go over your mouth and nose. (laughs) Just like masks that we have to wear these days. Oh, don't open that can of worms. Oh, no. (laughs) It is no use to you over just your mouth. No. No, indeed. Please pull down sharply. You um... don't have to rip the thing out of the socket. (laughs) But it's the pulling down of the mask that activates the oxygen generator. If you do not pull down sharply on it, you will have a plastic mask and a bit of tube, but nothing is coming out of it. The little bag that is attached will not fill up. It is not a balloon. It is just there to regulate. If you can breathe, everything is fine. (laughs) Do not worry about the little bag. 
<laughs> so I mean, we, we've touched sort of briefly on on the mask there. I mean, are there other scenarios in which the mask would be deployed? They're tucked up in uh, above your head, and those little doors that open are just held by magnetic latches. So when the cabin altitude reaches fourteen thousand feet, those latches are just released. So right. gravity then causes the mask to come to down. Fall down, okay. Hence why occasionally a mask will just drop just down drop. in isolation yeah. because just the, the, the magnetic latches it's just as come undone. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. And uh, obviously cabin depressurization, is that the only scenario in which the mask can be de deployed or, or can they be used uh, in, if, in other scenarios like, say, fire or anything like that? Okay, so bad idea to plunge a load of oxygen into a cabin okay. that has yeah. a fire. As, because... as I started to say that, I thought, oh, I'm going to get picked up for that, aren't I? <laughs> yes, yes, good point. Yeah, oh, yeah, high, high levels of oxygen and a fire, perhaps not the healthiest of mixes. <laughs> yeah, probably akin to using petrol to put out a fire. <laughs> okay, lesson learned. It's a perfectly reasonable question, and no... We do have the ability to deploy them manually, primarily because if we have reached a cabin altitude of 14,000 feet or greater, part of our checklist is to make sure that the masks are deployed. Right. So in other words, it's a human backup system that, yeah, to make sure that the masks are correct. Like, yeah. Generally, we wouldn't deploy the masks in the cabin for, for other scenarios because once you pull down on the mask, it's a chemical generator that produces oxygen and there's no way of turning it off. Right. So it's not like an on-demand system. Okay. Um, it just pumps oxygen out. So not, not ideal to suddenly have a, a sudden increase in oxygen in the cabin unless you know why you're doing right. that. Okay. Captain Al, as always, it's a real pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. If you'd like to watch more from our great series, then you can do that by pressing here. We've also created you a playlist with all the Plain Truth episodes, and you'll find that just here. Why not like and subscribe to our channel? That way you will be notified whenever we post our great content. Or if you've got a question that you'd like Captain Al to answer, then why not pop it in the comments box below, and you may well feature on an upcoming episode of The Plain Truth.